today um, I am going to talk about the main topic will be about uh, doing the Ajax example using JSON and um, do, do, do what do I want to say about that oh you know we'll see how it's different than than the other two examples um, what's the same what's the difference or sort of like we did with XML before I get into that, though, do you have any questions about either the delimited example or the XML example? Anything not clear as far as that goes? For that XML, can you, um, can you add CSS to those? Can you add CSS to the XML tags? Um, there. No. Uh, well, no. Um, but keep in mind, the, the question was, can you add CSS to that? Um, the end result is yes, you can. All right? But you wouldn't add them directly to the XML. So, for example, and let's pull up the example and show you what I mean. That probably would be a lot easier than me trying to describe it. Yeah, imagine line 57 in the code. Remember what that looked like? Well, we just did this instead. Because remember, the XML comes back from the server. Um, and the client then takes that and formats it. So part of the client's job of taking that and formatting it can involve doing it in a way that CSS comes into effect. So I'll show you sort of what I mean uh, in this example. Um, so let me let me move that over. Oh, I don't know why, but I opened up the Microsoft browser this morning. Nothing against Microsoft, but I normally don't use their browsers, so I'll put things in other places. Downloads. All right. So let me copy this over here. To CI NetPub. WW root. I'm going to clear these guys out first. So, this is what the server sends back to the client if I type something in. So if I type in if I type in A D, it comes up with a list of items. All right. Or if I pick this and type click go, it comes up with that. All right. So let's look at what the server turns back. The server turns back in this case it would turn back XML that looks like this. So I can't add CSS to this. It's not going to return CSS. It's just going to return a plain XML. So the server won't return the CSS. However the client as part of the client's job of taking that and formatting it, it will apply some CSS to it, or it could apply some CSS to it. And let me show you what I mean. So if I go into here and I look at this guy,
Remember, this client code is responsible for taking back what it got from the server and formatting it. So this is the instruction that formats it, or not the instruction, the function that formats it. So in this case, I'm building a drop-down list. All right. Now, the drop-down list doesn't have any style to it. The drop-down list is just this guy here. Oops, this guy here. I could apply some style to that. So I could, for example, say id equals dd words. And then I could apply some style to dd words. background yellow with 500 pixels or whatever. So sensitive. I did that just to remind you it's case sensitive. So now if I type in something the results get the style to it, but the style was not put in the XML. The style was put in the thing that formats it. Likewise, the other thing I could do is, and this isn't with the XML part, but it could be with XML, is when I'm outputting the data on get translation, I could do something like set the set the css of the html that got generated remember the server's job is uh, to send back the data anything with the formatting should be handled through the client side so there I just went and I put a class of result on that div and I could add that class to the div if I had a result. I could also do some testing and if there wasn't any answer I could style it differently. Um, Let me show you what I mean. If I have a valid result, I'm going to set the class to result. If there is no valid result, I'm going to set the class to no result. So, in other words, if I pick, if there's no result, I'm going to set the class to that to no result. All right, I'll, I'll try to show you what I mean. I'll try to show you how it works first, then we'll go back and revisit the code. So, 
So, in other words, if I type in something and get a translation, it sets it to that. Oh, I made the style the same. Let me let me change the style to a different value because otherwise it wouldn't be obvious. However, if I had typed in something like that, click this guy and said go, it, the style is now that. All right. So what I did in this case is, again, the client handles the CSS. I created two classes, one for a valid result, one for an invalid result. And if this happens, I got a valid result, so I set the style to it to the valid result style. If this happens, I have an invalid result, so I set the style to the invalid result. Uh, so again, your original question, um, can I put CSS on the XML? Um, you can put, you can, you can form the results, you can format the results to come back from the server using CSS, but that CSS will not be included in the XML. All right, is sort of the, 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 the short version, the too long didn't read version of what I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, all right, or whatever. Other questions? And that's important because I've had students, uh, and maybe even in this class, I don't remember, but in past classes, I've had students send HTML back from the server. All right? Now, that's not horrible. All right? The, the, the programming police aren't going to come and arrest you for doing that. All right? But it does limit you because it's possible to use the same server-side script to produce the same uh, output uh, from a variety of different clients. And those clients might want the data formatted a different way. All right? For, uh, for, for example, um, if you remember back uh, to the first Ajax example we talked about, um, we had a, a quiz. And we said that the quiz, we could show the results a couple of different ways. We could show which answer, you know, individually which answers they've gotten right or wrong. Or we could show the correct answer if they've gotten it wrong. Or we could just show them how many right and wrong they got without saying which specific questions. All right? So we might want to format it that different ways. And we might, in our system, if you imagine if this was incorporated in the canvas, we might do different things under different circumstances. For example, a practice quiz, if the student gets the, the, the answer wrong, maybe we tell them which question they got wrong and show them the right answer. All right? Because it's just a practice quiz. Where maybe if it was an actual test, maybe we simply just show what their score was or show which ones they got right and wrong and what their total percent was without telling them. All right? So we might have the same XML or, or server-side script returning data to different clients or different versions of the client that choose to display the results a different way. So if you're simply sending data back from the server, you have a better opportunity to do that. If you're sending formatted data, such as XML, back to the server, or such as HTML, I mean, from the server, then you're sort of locked into what the server is returning. So the ultimate flexibility is just return data from the server. Let the client decide exactly how it's going to format it. All right. Um, other questions about any of this? Let's look at, then, the JSON version. And JSON, J-S-O-N, uh, stands for JavaScript Object Notation. All right. Now again, that's a little bit of uh, a misnomer because you can JSON is just a format, just like XML is just a format. All right. So 
you can use JSON in any programming language. All right, we're going to use PHP to create JSON, for example. And you could use JSON to, again, communicate between different programming languages. It's just a way of describing data. All right, but it's a way like you describe data in JavaScript. So that's why they say JavaScript object notation. All right. Um, so there's a lot of lying going on in AJAX, right? Uh, AJAX stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Well, you don't have to use XML, all right? <laughs> We've seen other ways that you can do it. Uh, likewise, uh, JSON says uh, JavaScript object notation, but you don't have to use JavaScript. Now, in the case of AJAX, you will be using JavaScript, but you could use it in other platforms as well. All right, anyhow, let's look at the JSON example. And we'll see uh, this is very similar to the XML in that only some of it changes from the previous examples. In other words, not everything changes. The making of the request is the same. All right, the formatting of the request, so taking the value from the text box and sending the request to the server is identical, right? Because that is making the request. Nothing changes about making the request if you're using JSON or XML or whatever. All right. The formatting of the results changes because we're getting the data back in a different form. So, of course, the data is going to, uh, the, the way that we format the data is going to change if we're getting the data back in a different format. And also, the server side uh, script changes because it's creating data in a different format. So, of course, that's going to change. Now, the second AJAX request doesn't uh, change at all. All right, because that was simple enough that there's really no reason to do it any other way than with the limited data. So let me copy over the JSON example. see it works identical to how it did before. All right. So let's look at the code that generates it. First of all, creating the objects identical. Regardless of what method we're using to send the data back, you still need the um, XML HTTP object, right? Again, it's called an XML HTTP object, but it's for any sort of AJAX interaction, regardless of XML is used or not. XML HTTP request simply means that we're not getting back a complete web page from the server. We're getting back a piece of data, all right? And that piece of data can be formatted a number of different ways, delimited data, XML, or JSON. Making the request is the same. This is the identical code that we had in the other ones, right? Because the way that the data comes back doesn't influence how we ask for the data. We're still asking for the data from this script, and we're still passing on the query string the characters that were typed in um, on the query string. The last AJAX request, the second one, we didn't change at all, again, because that is so simple, we're getting back one word from the server. So there's really no need to do anything but send back that one word. All right, there's no need to do XML, there's no need to do JSON. Again, right tool for the right job. You know, 
XML provides a lot of flexibility, but that doesn't mean it's appropriate in all cases. Uh, in the cases where we're literally just returning back one single word, there's really no need to use XML or JSON. It would be overkill to do that. All right, so you might as well just return the one word, just as boom, the data. There you go. All right, now, where the fun starts in this example is the way the server makes the data and the way the client formats the data to create the dropdown. All right, and that's this function and the server code. Let's look at the server code. First of all, we'll look to see what JSON format looks like. And there's good materials online that talks in more detail about JSON. Um, but let's see in this case what the JSON formatted data looks like. It looks like this, which initially sort of looks like a mess. <laughs> but it's actually pretty straightforward. All right. Remember, we use the curly brackets to group things together in JavaScript. And that's what we're doing here, too. We're using curly brackets to indicate that this is a chunk of data. And the curly brackets match up, right? There's as many of the left ones as there are the right ones. And this defines the grouping of the data. For example, this is the data that we're sending back, this whole group. All right? Now, in JSON notation, the data is, is indicated in a way very similar to CSS. Let me open a file in Notepad and talk about what I mean. In JSON notation, you have the name of the variable, a colon, and the value of the variable. Then, you have a comma, and you have the name of the next variable, colon, and the next value. and so on. So that's how JSON works. All right? It's similar to XML in that XML also has tags. You can think of these names as variables as being like tags. They tell you what the data means. So it's sort of like XML in that it's self-descriptive. If you look at the data that comes from JSON, you get, in addition to the data, you get a description of what the data means. All right? You don't get that at all in delimited files. All right? You can also do nesting in JSON, which you can do uh, in, in XML, but you can't do easily in delimited data. Now, what do you suppose the square bracket means? What do we use square brackets for in JavaScript? Arrays. All right? So in other words, this word list, this is the name of the variable. This whole thing is the value of the variable. All right? And it starts with a square bracket and ends with a square bracket. That means it's an array. So word list is an array. All right? How do we define an array in JavaScript? If I was creating an array, hard coding, I would do it like this. Oops. I don't know where I'm typing. If I was doing an array in JavaScript, I would do value 1, value 2, and so on. This is if I were just, just defining a plain old array in JavaScript. Well, the only difference between an array here and an array in 
uh, JSON is I specify the name of the variable. And also, I can group things together. So for example, this is the first element of the array. How do I know it's the first element? Well, the curly brackets are used to group things together. So that's the first element. What does the first element of the array consist of? It consists of two variables, a word and an index. A word and index. Word, index, word, index. Here's the value, here's the value, here's the value, here's the value, and so on. The XML that this would be like would be like this. omitting the ending tags just for just in the interest of time so the word and then the index so that's essentially what this means the only difference is I don't have an item here I could put in here in the XML an item colon item colon and so on but I didn't All right, I could give a name to each of these Actually, I do have a name for each of these. It's word list. That's right. So actually, this would be more like this. JSON data, which consists of a word list array where the word list is repeated over and over and over again. And each word list tag is a word list element and so on. So element one is this array which consists of two variables, a word and an index. Element two, element three, element four. Okay, so that's what the data means. And that's what we get back from the server. Now, how do we parse this? How do we break this down? Well, fortunately, and here's a big advantage of both XML and JSON compared to uh, delimited data. Delimited data, you just get this big string. And it's your job to figure out how to break it up into its pieces. And normally what we do with delimited data is we do the split. We do the split to break it down by whatever the delimiter is, whether it be a semicolon or a comma or a tab or whatever, all right, depending on the kind of data it is. With JSON and XML, these are both well-defined objects. And in JavaScript, there is a way to call methods, pre-existing methods on objects to get the results that you want. So, for example, we look at this. Oops. When it comes back from the server, the ready state is four. I do this little eval. What does that eval do? It sort of does the final conversion to convert that string of data into a JavaScript object. So response is a JavaScript object. I can do this. I couldn't do this with just any old string. I couldn't do this with an XML string. All right? I can do this because this is a JSON string. So I can create it to a JavaScript object. So response is now a JavaScript object. All right? Notice that the result came back as part of the text. Right? we look at this, remember, we don't have output uh, the header saying it's XML. 
And I realize I skipped the server part. We'll come back to get it after I talk about the formatting. So the data comes back as part of the response text. I make an object into it, uh, out of it. Once there's an object out of it, I could call the pre-written functions. All right? This part's the same, this part's the same, this part's the same, this part's the same. The only difference is I ask for the list, the word list length. Well, what does that mean? Well, remember, back at our JSON data, word list is an array. And in JavaScript, you can ask for an array's length. So I say for i equals 0 to i less than the list, the length of the word list array. So I'm going to do this one time for every element in the word list. And I simply pull out of the word list for each element in turn, I look at that element in the word list array and pull out the word attribute and I pull out the index attribute. So the first time through the loop, I'm looking at word list sub zero. That's this guy here. I then ask for the word attribute and the index attribute. So it gives me addition and two. The second time through the loop, I'm looking at word list sub one. Brings out, then it, and I ask for the word attribute and index attribute all the way down the line. So that's what the code's doing. Simply looping through, looking at each element in the array, the word list array, and asking for the word that's associated with that element and the index that's associated with it. All right? So it's really not that complicated. Again, why is it not complicated? It's not complicated because once we get it in the form of a JavaScript object, there are functions that we can use. We don't have to write the code ourselves to split it into, uh, uh, into an array or whatever. It's defined as an array. We can start immediately working with it as an array. Any questions about this part of it? Now, the part that I skipped is how do we create the JSON data? And that, again, is pretty simple. It's much like the XML, all right? I'm doing the exact same thing I did way back with the first one. The only difference is, is in addition to outputting the data, um, I'm outputting the JSON stuff. So I set my results equal to this string. That's this part of the string. Every time I find a word that matches, I output this, I add that to the output. One thing that I don't know if we have talked about so far is the, the, the period is a way that you concatenate strings together. So I'm concatenating the results plus this or plus this plus this, plus this, and so on. So I'm forming that string in a variable called results. If, I'm not, if there aren't any, I format my message like I did before with an index of negative one. Then finally, when I'm all done, I close my brackets and braces and all that, and I output that to the client. So let's kind of take a step back and see how these things are different and how they are the same in this particular example. First of all, the second AJAX request stayed the same in all three of them because it was just so simple. There was no need to do anything but just a simple um, return to text. The other ones were different, not in the way that it created the, X, uh, the, the XML object because they all need the XML object. Not in the way that they um, initiated the request, because regardless of how the data is coming back, the request will be initiated the same way. So how do they differ? They differ in two, um, in two places. Number one, how the server responds to the client. And the difference there is simply a formatting thing. 
The basic shell of the code is the same, it's just that with AJAX and JSON, we output some additional stuff to make it AJAX, uh, make it JSON data and XML data. Whereas in delimited data, all we output is the data in the delimiters. So there's extra stuff when we're outputting in JSON or XML. And then, of course, the client has to change because if it's getting the data back, it, it has to parse it and separate it and uh, um, format the, the, the output differently. All right, so that's really the difference between these three methods. Any questions over any of this? If we had more time this semester, which you're probably going to groan, you know, I mean, these semesters, uh, by the end, it usually feels like it's time for them to end, right? Uh, if we had more time, if we had a couple more weeks, the one thing I would like to have done in this course would be to study database interactivity, all right? Because uh, I sort of tried to simulate it, uh, in this case, by having the two arrays and putting things in functions, um, uh, or putting things to the arrays in a clue, an include file, and that sort of simulated retrieving the data from uh, a database. Because um, really, server-side scripting really gets involved uh, and, and more flexible when um, you start pulling the database element in. It's tough with prerequisites, though. We don't want to bury students with prerequisites, so the database class isn't a prereq for this class, so we don't want to spend too much time on databases if we spend any so that's why I really didn't talk about it. But if you have a basic good understanding of PHP, then the database component would be the next component that you would want to try to add and try to think about. All right. The final, uh, I'll post an announcement sometime within the next couple of days about the final. It essentially will be available um, from sometime this weekend through sometime next week. And the final will be real similar in format to uh, the midterm. In other words, I'm not going to ask you to write whole programs. I might ask you to write a statement or two, and then I'm going to ask you about concepts. Um, pretty much anything we talked about throughout the semester is fair game because um, even if I were to say, hey, this is not comprehensive, it's just about PHP and, and AJAX, you know, the stuff we've covered since the midterm, um, well, um, to do AJAX, you need to know JavaScript anyhow. Right? So you need to know and understand how JavaScript works. The one thing I was going to add about this that I forgot is that there are uh, functions built into jQuery that help you do this AJAX stuff. Um, that's another thing I suppose that if I had more time this semester I, I also would talk about. Um, and uh, again, I think it's important to understand on a nuts and bolts level how these things work. All right? but for convenience, sometimes it's good to use the, the jQuery. Just like for, for whatever reason, anything that we've done in jQuery, you probably, if you spend enough time, could figure out a way to do it. But if someone's done it already for you, um, you know, um, you don't necessarily need to do it yourself. All right? It is good, however, to have, have a basic understanding of how Ajax works before you start using these tools. All right, any questions? All right, we'll see you in lab.